my, I think my husband faked me out a little bit. He told me he was going to have to work Sunday, so I started pe prepping, and then he <laughs> called me yesterday and was like, guess what? I don't have to work tomorrow. And it I worked. said, you want to teach? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it goes, of course. But um, the Lord had given me something a few months back, and, and to be honest with you, I just didn't know the timing of it. So um, whenever this happened, I thought, let's let's see what, what happens. So... Um, I'm going to be talking about distractions and decoys. And um, has anyone ever felt like as soon as you start really getting some momentum, you're you're accomplishing the task that God's given you? Like it, it may not be like um, going on the mission field, but it could be that the Lord's giving you something specific that He's asked of you. So um, it can be I want you to write this down, or I want you to go about this, this, and this. So. Um, or meet with someone. So you're supposed to go and have coffee with somebody and it's a person that you want to reach. And then all of a sudden weird things start to happen that seem completely unrelated. Um, these are usually distractions, right? So um, we may not know what they are at the time, but uh, it's something that I, in the last two years, especially prepping for this class, I've dealt with quite often. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, the, them being utilized uh, by the adversary and why they're being utilized. So historically, these two tactics were usually used by an adversary that knew that one, they were outnumbered or they had low ammunition. In other words, they're, they're running low on the actual thing that can, can destroy you. Or sometimes it's an initial test to see how you react, to see really what's going on beneath the surface. Um, and so military tactics of distraction and decoys are very well known. So one of the most historically well known ones is Trojan horse, right? And so everybody, uh, even on the computer now, they call that was a, was a Trojan. You know, they, they call different things uh, by this historical name because we understand that it's a unique situation. It wasn't just a um, break down the gates and, and plunder, right. but it was sly, it was slick, it mm -hmm. was very clever. And so, um, Looking at distractions, it's a thing that typically prevents someone from giving their full attention to something else. It's extreme agitation of the mind or emotions. In the Greek, it means to turn or become perplexed. So you get confused, you get turned around a little bit, you don't really know which way to go or how to tackle something. And this isn't just talking, this isn't talking about um, self distraction. It's not talking about time wasting or slothfulness. It's really talking about something that's trying to grab your attention away from the actual situation at hand. So this is deliberate. It's a deliberate attempt to exhaust you spiritually, emotionally, and sometimes even physically before a real fight begins. So I'm gonna to go to 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 23. And um, it's Paul addressing the, uh, the church in Corinth. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so I, adore, I ordain I in all churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not be uncircumcised. If any called in, or in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of commandments of God. Right. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be ye not the servants of men. Paul was trying to make sure that God's people didn't become sidetracked by social conventions or labels. He was refocusing them on keeping the main thing, the main thing. What's the main thing? God. We can also get so caught up with distractions that we miss the main objective. Right. This was causing division within their congregation. They were thinking one was holier than the other based on the law previously or labels that people had. So it was almost kind of developing a class system within the church as well. This person's a servant, this person's you know, not this person's free. He says, care not for it. Don't don't worry about that stuff. Like you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing and it's becoming a problem. The enemy can utilize distractions to not just get us turned around, but completely worn out. 
We will waste time and resources on distractions and away from the job or the mission at hand. Yep. When the real, real work of God is needed, we're exhausted. Mm -hmm. We are in desperate need of a sabbatical or spiritual rest because we're spent. We've wasted a, a complete amount of time on something, especially emotionally. Usually that's where he gets most of us is because it's hard to separate. You know, if it's a physical thing, we, we address it and move on. But when it's an emotional thing, it becomes very difficult to separate those things. So I'm going to use a military uh, operation called Left Hook that was uh, by the U.S. and Allied Forces in Operation Desert Storm. So they saw one of their most successful uses of distraction or deception using radio signals. They were used in warfare. So the Iraqis' attention was on the amphibious training maneuver by the United States Marine Corps, leading them strongly to believe that the Americans would invade through their coastline. So they shifted everything. They, they prepared for this. They were like, oh, this is what's going to happen. They're going to come to the coastline. They're, that's where they're going to attack. And so then on top of that, the 18th and 5th Corps uh, yeah, uh, headquarters began their maneuvers through the desert in a massive flanking maneuver known as left hook, where they were able to effectively outflank the Iraqis and attack while also blocking any avenue of retreat. So from Iraq to Kuwait, during these maneuvers, the court, the court signals unit broadcast, broadcast mimic signals, which effectively made the Iraqis believe the units were completely stationary, that they weren't moving. So they're not only had them thinking, we got to focus on the coastline, but now they think these people aren't even going anywhere, we're safe. So they move everything. And uh, it was interesting, they said the result was a ground war that lasted only three days and the Iraqi, Iraqis completely withdrew. And most of their armies surrendered to Americans and allied troops who had cut off their escape. This is a great example of misdirection and distraction. Sometimes this happens with just a rephrasing or mimicking of a message. From It can be from anyone. I'm not talking about messages just from here, but they sound like the real thing. They sound good and may even look good, but it's, a knock, it's knocking us off course and it's shifting us away from the true goal. World War II has tons of examples of this where Germany planted messaging that was to distract the British from the current state of affairs, good or bad, and had them focus on the possibility of the future terror. Like if I can get them scared enough that when we do show up, they're so distracted that they actually will just surrender. Because yeah. surrender is the goal. They want you to be so worn out emotionally and mentally that when the, the, the actual attack happens, you kind of just give up because you've used all the resources that you should have used for other things. So surrender is the goal here. So I had something happen. Um, this was a few, uh, probably a month back and I, the Lord had given me a subject to study on. And um, I, I told my husband, I said I was in prayer and um, I was praying about something totally different. And something was bothering me and I was, it, it was taking an emotional toll on me and, the, and I'm praying about it and everything. and. I could tell I wasn't really getting anywhere and the Lord just told me stop stop he said you tend to what I told you to tend to this is a distraction you do what I and I'll take care of this like you you leave this alone and that's the first time he's ever told me like stop and I was like oh and here I was I mean I was crying I was very much you know and but I had focused some resources on something on a battle that I thought I was supposed to be fighting right now when I wasn't it was a little bit of a message that I, I was getting from the enemy to try and re redirect me and so um, I think distraction is a great tool that the enemy uses to yeah. try and get us to pick apart uh, pick apart each other to cause division instead of us moving forward as a group instead we start to separate out and we start to feel like we don't belong um, that is a great distraction and I think they've mentioned it many times over the pulpit where you'll all of a sudden start to feel like you don't belong, that people are talking about you, those kinds of things. That's a distraction because yeah. you have no proof. There's no evidence of it, nothing, you know, hard evidence of those things. So while distractions are interesting, the more dangerous are decoys. 
and it comes from the root word in Dutch meaning the cage. Decoys are different than distractions, very different. Has anybody here been duck hunting or seen some of the little decoys that they have where they float them in the water to try yeah. and attract the birds? And um, they're deceptive in nature. They're to draw us in and have us believe there's safety when destruction is waiting. So it's a person or thing that is used to mislead or lure an animal into a trap. And I wanted to talk about a story that is rather obscure. Um, me and my husband did a, a family devotion over it um, months and months ago. And Lord brought it to mind. It's in 1 Kings 13, 1 through 24. So it's long, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piece it out. So, um, and behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the wor word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar of the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass that when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which was being put forth, dried up, so that it could not pull it again unto him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out, out of the altar, exactly how the, the man of God had said, according to the sign, and was given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand shall be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored unto him, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of God, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. This is very obvious that, that this king is wicked. And so the invitation from a wicked king was an obvious no, right? He had already had direction from the Lord. Don't stop. Don't eat. Don't go. You know, he told him specifically what to do. So it was pretty straightforward. He didn't leave it up for debate or anything. Um, and the prophet was like, even if you gave me half your kingdom, I'm not going home with you, right? You just tried to take me down over here by the altar and now all of a sudden you're like oh come home with me it sounds like a fairy tale uh, story right um nothing to see here uh but so he went another way and returned not by the way he came to bethel he did everything he was supposed to now there dwelt an old prophet in bethel and his sons came and told him and all the works of the man of god had done that day in bethel the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they also told to their father. And their father said unto them, What way did he go? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, he which came from Judah. And he said unto his son, Saddle me a donkey. So we saddled him, and we rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me in the word of the Lord, thou shalt not eat bread, nor drink water, nor turn again. He tells him the same thing he told the king. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thy house, that he may eat and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. You see, it's harder to fight an enemy that looks and acts just like you do. Yeah. Even though it was counter to what God had already spoken to the man of God, it sounded plausible. The offer seemed much easier to accept and trust because they had so much in common. Yeah. What is so interesting about this story is they never really explain the prophet's old prophet's motives to gain the favor of the man of God. It's almost as if he just wanted to have this man because he was, he'd done something pretty spectacular. His, no, his notoriety was there, and he just wanted to have dinner with him. It seems almost like it's not nefarious, but clearly, I mean, 
he blatantly lied and angel of the Lord did, came and why did he do that? I have no idea. So, and it came to pass as they sat at a table that the word of the Lord came into the prophet that brought him back. The old prophet, the one that lied. He speaks and he says, and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah saying, thus saith the Lord for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hath not kept the commandment which the Lord the God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in this place, of which the Lord did say thee, eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall come unto the, shall not come into the sepulchre of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the donkey to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him in the way and slew him. His carcass was cast away in the way and the donkey stood by it and the lion also stood by the carcass. The old prophet blatantly lied and deceived the man of God with a new word, new word, that directly contradicted the order from God. Can I tell you, God is not a God of inconsistency or confusion. Yeah. They should have, it should have been a tip off to the prophet that the very thing he was ordered to do of the Lord was now being redirected or shifted. And, but because they were common ministry, I mean, they couldn't have been more in, in line with each other, right? So, and that he hears from God as well. He put his guard down. He thought, mm. and so it, it's interesting to me that it doesn't say that the enemy is using this old prophet or anything like that, but he allowed himself to be deceived and he put someone else's word above what God had told him. In Matthew 7 and 15, he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. These are described in the Greek as cruel, greedy, and destructive men. They are not obvious, but seek out their own ends. Ravening wolves means extortioner, obtaining benefit through coercion. Hmm. They're very convincing and will kill almost anything. Even animals twice their size, wolves will kill. He says in the next scripture, Matthew 7 and 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? So we have to ask ourselves when we're looking for these things, and I'm not saying you go and look for people. I guess what I'm saying is when someone's trying to influence you and something feels off, well, you need to start asking yourself, what fruit is being produced in this person's personal life? Yeah. Not what you see here, mm-hmm. but what's going on here? Yeah. Is there chaos and confusion? Do they always seem wrapped up in drama? Mm-hmm. Is there a growth and hunger for righteousness? Or are they always trying to kind of curb that? And they have their own way of looking at things. Are their relationships sound? Do they treat their family with godly love and respect? Are they, are they someone that treats their spouse with respect? Is it somebody that there's balance in their life? Or does it look really good here, but as soon as you walk away, there's a different person there? So another example militarily uh, that they call wolves in sheep, sheep's clothing, and it was used during World War I because these new boats had been developed. It's called submarines, and they were U-boats problem was we had no way to sonar had barely been utilized before so to come up with another option the uh the military different military fleets actually um would dress themselves up as a german boat and try to get them to come out of the water and they would fly a different flag all these things until the u-boat showed itself because before that they couldn't they really couldn't see them and this was very successful um, if, if they would pillage, they would do all these things. So um, it was uh, it was very very interesting to see how much deception goes on in military tactics, especially long long before. So it's something to keep in mind whenever we're understanding that sometimes we think attacks are just come guns blazing, right? So when it doesn't happen that way, sometimes we think like, oh, it's not an attack; it's just something I need to tend to. And we'll overextend ourselves in things that are not necessary and we'll Good. start to listen to someone that is not it's it's contradicting what we already know is truth yeah. so what's the solution 
solution is watchfulness. Mm -hmm. For the result of distraction is weariness and hopelessness, and the end game of decoys is spiritual death or sleep. We must be vigilant. It says, harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. And it says here that, oh, I'm missing one of my scriptures. Okay, Matthew 10 and 16. Behold, I send you forth, God sending you forth, as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You have to, you have to be understanding that when he says serpents, we always think the negative. When he says wise as serpent, this means that you better be prepared and clever and understand what you're supposed to know. And so, and this is something I pray quite often is James 1 and 5. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that he giveth all men liberally. He gives it to all of us and abradeth not. In other words, he's not going to chastise you for not knowing. And it shall be given to him. I pray quite frequently, Lord, you said if I needed wisdom, let me and let, let us ask. I'm asking. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So what does it mean to watch and what does it mean to be vigilant? So when I was talking about distractions, that's typically very, very emotionally draining. Um, when me and my husband were doing youth ministry, we actually had uh, several situations that would come up that felt emotionally draining. And you wouldn't immediately recognize them as distractions until you realize there was nothing that you could do to solve it. That's usually a distraction. Yeah. If I'm not actually going to fix this or help someone with this, really all they're doing is kind of just doing this to you, right? Um, I was teaching one morning and uh, teaching a lesson and I was fired up about it. I was excited. And this girl comes up to me right afterwards and says, I need to talk to you. And, you know, your lesson spoke to me. And I thought, okay, wonderful. You know, I think I'm pregnant. I was like, oh, okay. So we go through this huge, you know, we're trying to help and all this stuff and set up times with their parents and everything. But when we started to meet with the parents, it became very clear that there was a pattern here that we weren't going to break. Yeah. Um, it was very odd, like, it, and it was very heavy because you feel like you should be able to do something, but if the parents won't intervene, there's no, I mean, I can't go home with her and be like, hey, let's, you know, come to find out it was complete, she wasn't, and, but there was all this drama and all this workup, and me and him were tired. This went on for a couple of days, and so pastor was out of town, and we always tried not to bother him with too much, but, you know, we told him about it, and he told my husband, I think it's a distraction because based on kind of what we, there was no solution. We weren't able to help. We weren't able to intervene in any way. They weren't susceptible to any kind of help or, or guidance because they had already created this environment that this behavior had been going on for a very long time. And he walked into Bishop Cole's office and he put out his finger to uh, Pastor Carr and said, it's a distraction. Hmm. Exactly what we were thinking it was, but it's, it's hard to know sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand. And so we, when we get weary, we become tired and we start to, it's easier to sleep spiritually because when you're tired, you can't take anything else in, right? right? It's hard to learn something. It's hard to pay attention because you're done. And how many times do we find ourselves fighting off distractions when we could be doing productive things? You know, distractions to me have always been very emotional weights and it may not even be something that I need to be carrying so I'm very careful with social media I told my husband it affects how I feel if I start looking I don't I've never looked at our young people's Facebook pages for self-preservation <laughs> right <laughs> let's be honest I didn't because here's the thing if I go to pray within the altar I don't want to know all of that yeah. like I know that may sound crazy because people can get I, I can't do that because emotionally I can't handle it because you want to either throttle them or you know you want to go have a conference with the throttle them but you want to have a conference with them all the time but you know what it did too it not only hurt it would hurt us like somebody would come and tell me did you see such and such no I didn't see it I don't want to see it and they almost felt like I was putting burying my head in the sand but I was like there's nothing I can do about that unless there's some kind of intervention that the Lord knows 
the Lord's better than Facebook. If something I can do about somebody else, he'll tell me. That's, that's the answer that I need. I don't need somebody on fit, the social media to tell me what's going on. The Lord knows what's relevant to me and what's not. Mm -hmm. So I literally, legitimately, unless there's a storm in the Gulf, I'm really not on Facebook. <laughs> you know, when it, June hits, it's about the time that I go look at a couple of weather pages, making sure that everything looks good. But I don't go, I don't go to other people's profiles. You know what? It depresses me. And I can't, I can't alter my mood based on somebody else's bad life choices or, or silly that's stuff. Good. But that's a real distraction. And so I've told my husband before, I was like, I can't, I just can't engage in that. And as a youth minister, that may sound crazy, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I knew I'm going to be so frustrated with them. You see frustration, ooh, that can work you over. Yeah. I'll be so frustrated with them that I can't see what needs to happen spiritually because all I see is what needs to happen on the external. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very little of the problem. But distractions are so powerful that when we first took over this class or created this class, whatever you want to call it, um, he was actually having to work in, um, on a Sunday, no less, and I was supposed to teach for the first time. Well, I was stressed out because I'd only ever taught kids. And I was like, this could be a disaster and I'm by myself and you know all this stuff. And so I'd go to the grocery store and um, now I've, I've written a lot of uh, my message by this time, but I hadn't finished it. And I was, I was aggravated already because, that I was working through it. And I'm, I'm in my vehicle coming home. And this guy next to me starts flagging me down and being obnoxious and starts trying to follow me and all this other business. And I get mad because I'm like, this reminds me of being 16 and living in Port Arthur where, you know, you just, it was this culture where it was just like, hey, 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 hey. I was like, I'm not even looking at you. Like, what do you want? <laughs> By the time I get home, I'm so aggravated. I'm emotionally just, ooh, I'm so mad. Cause I'm like, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. I have no reason for this. Da, 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 da. And Jake's like, what's wrong with you? Like I'm carrying groceries and I'm like this, you know, I'm, I'm angry. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly. He said, it's a distraction. And I was like, oh. Emotionality just went right out of me. I was like, okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't engage in that. The enemy was trying to throw me off to where I would be so engaged emotionally that I couldn't focus and I, I wouldn't focus. But it altered my mood. It like affected who I was. And so 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Doctrine is what we should believe. Yeah. Reproof, however, is what we should not believe, what we should reject. However, if we are not taking in God's word, these operations are not effective in our lives. The Lord can't correct me if I'm not reading it. The Lord can't reproof me situations in my life if I'm not taking it in it's it's profitable for these things if I'm utilizing it yeah. in instruction and in righteousness I cannot say that if I'm not meditating on his word and taking it in consuming it that any of these things are at work in my life right. so when the Lord can speak to me when and I, I he speaks to us on all different ways but I told my husband the other day, I said, whenever the Lord, I ask a question, a lot of times he'll bring scripture to mind. He won't just say, oh, well, Kayla, it's this, this, and this. No, usually he'll say, you remember this, and you show you this over here, and he'll show me several. And I'll be like, oh, because it's already there, right? He can pull out things that you've already read, but he's not going to miraculously be like, and... And, you know, this obscure uh, prophet, uh, you know, like he, he's not going to pull out Second Kings if I've never read it. And so I have to be acknowledging that the word of God is what's going to balance out the decoys. See, God's not going to give somebody a new revelation that contradicts his word. Right. Yeah. He's not going to give you give somebody in your life that tells you something that is going to lead you in a way that is not what God has already established. I was actually mentioning this to Stephanie, but as somebody that grew up in church, it was very hard for me to separate that when church people would say things to me that I wouldn't associate it with spiritual things. When somebody was just giving their opinion, I would immediately be like, oh, that almost, almost like, well, a message from the Lord. Probably. 
probably not. Yeah. They're just telling you stuff. <laughs> We're human. But you know what happens is we associate everything that happens here with some kind of spiritual guidance. Not realizing people are people. They didn't know I took it like that. Or maybe they were hoping I would. Or, I, you know, I don't know. But, I mean, I had people speak things in my life that I was just like, man. I had a, I had a woman uh, come to me when after I graduated high school saying, you're going to be a missionary. So I told my parents. I said, I need, to, I need to enroll in TBC or I need to go to. And my parents were like, that's not what we discussed. <laughs> and I was mad about it. And so my pastor's wife, though, told my mom, she said, an angel from the Lord would have to tell me that uh, I was being called to the mission field. She was like, who, who told her that and this, this, and this? And she was like, you know, I think people mean well. She said, but she needs to just pray about that and see. We'll come to find out that, you know, she, again, meant well. But I needed to balance out that the Lord already had a plan. And something new that and, and shiny and exciting looked great. But it wasn't it wasn't based in truth. It wasn't based in what God had wanted. And here, John 10 and 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know, I've talked about this scripture before because I feel like it's so powerful. But sheep are interesting things. Have you ever sat in service and you leaned over and said, what did they say? I did this to the announcements the other day because Jackson could ask me something. I asked my mom, I said, what were they announcing just now? See, I was hearing it second or third hand. And see, sheep, when we move with the herd, it's, have you ever seen sheep? They, you know, they kind of move almost like birds do sometimes. And even if they're all going off a cliff, they're, you know, like... And they're all moving together. But what happens is there's one or two that start moving. We start moving with the herd rather than listening for the voice of God. So it can sound. I'm hearing I'm hearing everyone move. But did I hear his voice? Did I, did I hear what he had to say? Or am I hearing it second or third hand and I'm moving with the group? And I'm moving with the flow? And so when I read this scripture today, the Lord showed me. He said that the herd all of a sudden someone sees someone move and they go oh I'm supposed to go with them mm -hmm. oh I'm supposed to what if what if it's a wolf that starts that yeah. what if it's somebody that doesn't have discipline in their life good. it looks good we don't want to miss we don't want to miss the voice of God we don't we don't want to miss an opportunity but what if the panic was started by a wolf in sheep's clothing mm -hmm. yep. what if it's started by something that isn't we have to know the Word of God through the Word of God, when I pray, the Word of God is so powerful if I've already been meditating and taking it in because He can speak back to me in those ways. Yeah. And so a lot of the times I wonder, you know, I we can do a lot of talking there in prayer, but if I don't give Him time to talk to me, mm -hmm. I know that's not maybe popular, but having some quiet time with the Lord is, mm -hmm. a, for me, is a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to say much of anything but when I do pray I want to I want to give him a time to speak and show me things but I'm telling you it's been rare that he's ever said anything that wasn't already in the Word of God yeah you know like he may he may personalize some things but he's going to use his word for all these different things but had I not taken it the time to bring that to my attention if there's things I'm skipping I'll be honest with you I don't like numbers um, as the as a book of the Bible but sometimes we have to say okay he put it here for a reason I need to I need to sit and I need to read this or I'm in Exodus right now because I finished all the uh, the New Testament and the, the minor prophets and I was like I'm gonna start next to this. I know he's gonna go through every little piece of furniture again in the tabernacle and I'm gonna want to glaze over it but there's going to be things in here that I'm going to need later on. If he wants to speak to me the way he wants to, he's going to use his whole word. Yeah. He's not going to just use Acts 2.38, and he's not going to just use the epistles. He's going to pull stuff from all over. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not taking it in, what can he do? Right. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so important now more than ever. You think that in the end times... Or this last day, he's not going to pull up every single tactic he has. And if we're easily distracted or we don't know how to tell a decoy from the real thing, we're in trouble. Yep. 
I, I really, really felt so strongly, we have to know his voice. Mm -hmm. I cannot rely on my husband even, because there's gonna be times where I'm by myself. And if I'm allowing something to speak into my life that's not relevant, yep. I could plant a seed and it starts to germinate before he can start something. And he can say, hey, hold on. Yep. There needs to be that for us personally. The word of God to me is so powerful. I think sometimes I wonder what Paul would do if he had had a full New Testament. Yeah. Right? He would imagine we are so blessed to have the full word of God. And I say, God, forgive me for the years that I was neglectful, yeah. that I wasn't taking it in the way I should. I was piecemealing things together and I wasn't doing it the right way. But I I felt so strongly that the church is going to be attacked in these two ways just to get us off the prize. Yeah. Because if we can become tired and we can't hear his voice, we're prime pickings for the ones that are just going to yeah. wander off. Yeah. And we'll wonder, how did that happen? Yeah. We weren't being vigilant. We weren't looking. The vigilance isn't looking out here. It's looking in here. What else do I need to change? What else yeah. do I need to do? God, what is your word saying to me today? Because if I'm shored up, I don't need to necessarily worry so much about the bad outside things. Yeah. That's pretty much everything I have. Amen. Very good. Did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, two things that came to mind while you're talking, especially here, the latter part of it, is something I often pray is, don't let me be doctrinally distracted. Um, don't let me be doctrinally deceived. And I feel like that can easily happen when we start to look at other people's opinions mm -hmm. and start to accept that as truth. You know, and, and it, it's very easy to do. And like you said, if we're not in the Word, studying the Word, knowing the Word, we will, we will mistake truth for what is really an opinion. Right. And so I want to make sure that doctrinally I'm grounded and firm and like you said, ingesting the word of God is the only way for that to happen. Right. Only way. And, and so it, it's on a personal level. But it's funny because um, Mia just went to uh, Arkansas camp like Friday. Mm -hmm. And so she's there in Arkansas camp. And mom and dad are seven hours away. So like I had to sit down with her and I'm like, look here. <laughs> right. And one of the things I told her, I said, I've heard way too many preachers behind a pulpit say, young ladies, you need to find you a man that's praying in the altar. <laughs> I vehemently disagree, okay? <laughs> I don't care what you do in a church service. Mm -hmm. I want to see how you're acting at the afterburner. That's good. The Bible doesn't say how we respond in a church service determines the type of prayer. It says, no, by our fruit we shall be known. And so, yeah, I can play good church all day. Yep. And a young man can play good church all day, but watch him with his buddies. Yeah. And so it's like we have to be careful how we judge people and how we uh, accept people. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy for me to weep in the presence of the Lord at a church service. But what's my fruit showing outside of the church? I don't want to be distracted by the decoy. So it, it, vigilance, it's so good. Thank you for this lesson. I love it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You know, I...
you can go, oh yeah, these things are good, but uh, this yeah. stuff doesn't right. match. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. It's it's it is amazing that whenever it's an operation in your life, again, you kind of remain silent, but at the same time, he's constantly telling you, hold on, that's reproof. Yeah. No, you don't need that. <laughs> no, don't need that. Yeah. And it's funny because that doesn't mean that we know everything. Right. That's that's the Holy Ghost saying, "I've got this." You don't, okay. you know. Like, <laughs> um, and and so I think sometimes people think that you said nerd, but. There was a minister recently that said, people that fall in love with the Word of God, you're falling in love with the person because He is the Word. Mm -hmm. So the more I dig into this, the more I'm showing my appreciation and my love for knowing who He is. Right. And it's funny, there was a, a, a Jewish commentator that said, everyone gets confused about um, making different people main characters of different books of the Bible. He said, the main character is God. Yeah. We'll forget that. Yeah. We'll make Exodus about Moses mm -hmm. and the children of Israel. We'll make Genesis about Ab uh, Adam and Eve, you know, eating the fruit. And we'll make, and we'll forget this is this is all about Him yeah. from beginning to end. And so when we start taking it in that way, it's such an intimate experience that whenever people do violate the word, you get angry. Yeah. Like you know, like <laughs> what I mean is like when somebody misinterprets God or, or uses a scripture incorrectly, we'll. We may not say anything, but our spirit starts to, to burn within us, and we're like, that's not what it says, you know? But it's one of those things where it's an appreciation for, it would be like somebody saying, well, Jake said such and such, and I'd be like, no, he didn't. I was right there. He did not say that. We come to defense of the word. Why? Because he's so important. Yeah. It's not just, well, it's, you know, that's, that's it. So everybody can say it a different way. No, you can't. You know, my Lord didn't say that. And I get really frustrated sometimes whenever, if in myself, if I don't catch something, and you know, he'll be like, "Did you, you know, did you catch this or did you know that?" And I'll be like, "Why didn't I catch that?" You know. But it's one of those things where I need the appreciation. I have to know the voice of God. It's, it's just too important. And I think that for now, it has been one of those things that has pushed and pushed and pushed and drive me because again, it affects how I pray. I can have a Holy Ghost shindig, but for having understanding in prayer has been so powerful and revelatory for me that he can use his word to bring back and show me when I'm praying different things. And I want to encourage you, like, don't just, if you find yourself blazing over, stop and reread it again, but pay attention. Like, that's a hard thing for all of us is to be very present with, with the word of God. If I notice that I'm that I'm reading something but my mind has strayed, I'm like, Ugh. it's kind of like listening to your spouse and they're they're still talking and you go, oh, I forgot they're still talking. I'm, you know, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. I don't want to do that to the Lord. I, you know, like he'll be like, you're still, you're still talking. No, I'm just kidding. But it is one of those things. Think about it, right? Like we we want to be present. I want to hear His voice. So I want to encourage you. There is a solution. And that doesn't mean that when you find a decoy that he was necessarily after you. Sometimes the Lord will show you um, what they are. And uh, that doesn't mean that you have to call them out. You just keep your distance. Right? <laughs> She's laughing over here. You are a decoy. No, we're not doing that. But Call them out. <laughs> that would be the worst. Well, where'd you learn that from? Sister Kayla told me that. Uh, I'd be like, please, please no. Like Don't do that. <laughs> Love you guys. Find someone you don't know and introduce yourself. <laughs>